the culture in which one is immersed changes the meaning of the experience itself. Hey, humans! humans. Welcome to Demystifying Science, the only show where you can watch another species in conversation with a human. Today, we spoke with Daniel Smith, a journalist, author, and professor at NYU. He's been studying various forms of mental illness for several years, and we wanted to catch up with him about his 2007 book, Muses, Mad Men, and Prophets, Hearing Voices and the Borders of Sanity. Originally, we planned to speak with him mostly about stuff in the book, the nature of hearing voices, the evolutionary psychology of religious thought, and how something like schizophrenia is culturally interpreted today versus how it was perceived in the distant past. But because Daniel is currently training to become a therapist and is working on a collection of essays about the very nature of emotions, the conversation quickly expanded into questions of meaning, psychological well-being, and ways in which humans tend to instrumentalize everything. In human thought, everything becomes a tool at some point, if you're not careful. It's a conversation that was heavily informed by our previous talk with Dr. Ian James Kidd about the virtues and vices of misanthropy. Except this time, we placed an emphasis on the role of pessimism. And though Daniel is not very hopeful about the human ability to change the fundamental dysfunctional structures that inform society, we did end on an optimistic note. He's very enthusiastic about the ability of generalist thinkers, people who combine philosophy, anthropology, biology, and neuroscience, to create explanations and narratives that can help humans move forward. So we hope you'll add your own ideas to the comments section, and remember, we keep this channel ad-free since, well, we have no use for human money here in outer space. But it is true that you can make a real difference by supporting us with a like and subscribe so we can keep on bringing the conversations. Do it. And take care, humans. See you, see you next week. Bye. Oh, hello. Hello. So, you're a writer. What do you study? I study a whole bunch of things. I have written a lot about uh, psychology, human psychology and uh, mental illness and psychiatry. Um, I have written two books, one that is a memoir about the experience of anxiety, one that is a kind of cultural history of auditory hallucinations, of hearing voices. Um, and I'm writing a book right now, my third, about negative emotions, a kind of book of personal essays, each about a particular negative emotion. Um, and I've, I've done a lot of reporting and journalism about these subjects. So let's start with this question of hearing voices. Sure. Do all humans hear voices? A lot more humans than a lot of people um, assume hear voices. Okay. Um, there are a bunch, there have been a number of surveys over the years and it doesn't seem to be a very uncommon experience when you're thinking about it in, in more casual terms. So a human being falling asleep and as they're falling asleep, hearing a voice, um, as they're waking up, this is known as hypnagogic, hypnopompic imagery, um, this sort of twilight zone of consciousness where it's uncertain whether something is actually heard or whether it's created solely by the mind without any real sensory experience. Most of us have had an experience, most humans have had the experience of walking in a shop, walking down the street and thinking we've heard someone call our name or say something and then turning around and there being no one there or it not have happening, happened. Um, so in those terms, it's, it's fairly common. Um, and there are probably a lot more people who hear voices on a regular basis uh, than we know, but who don't really talk about it. Hmm. Because in human culture, if you hear voices, you're generally thought to be crazy. Hmm. But there are cultures where the people who hear voices aren't crazy, right? Yes, and Western culture was one of them. 
I mean, there's a there is a great speech by Aldous Huxley, I think, from the '60s. Aldous Huxley, the uh, the the novelist and critic, who who said that it was always difficult to be someone who had these experiences. There, it was always dangerous. It was always dangerous because there was you you could be taken as someone who um, was rather honored. You were hearing the voice of God, or you're hearing the voice of angels, or you were divinely inspired. But at the same time, you could be suspect and people could be suspicious of you because perhaps the voices come from somewhere else. Um, but the difference is that in the past, before the rise of modern psychiatry, there was meaning. There was, there was the possibility of cultural meaning in this. Um, way back in ancient Greece, of course, the experience of hearing voices had a profound religious meaning. Um, it meant that the gods were speaking to you. Um, most, most of our modern faiths, uh, particularly Abrahamic faiths, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, are all based on experiences of hearing the voice of God. So there was honor to it. There was meaning, even though you might get burned at the stake. There was there was some sort of cultural heft behind it, and that's kind of that's what's that's what in my in my research that's what I've come to conclude is that that's what's changed. And part of what I was trying to do when writing about it is try to understand the mechanism by which we went from hearing voices as something that was imbued with a spiritual or poetic meaning into something that is just almost. Um, reflexively indicative of of insanity. Does any particular religion still encourage listening to these voices? Yes, in a way. So there's a really great anthropologist um, named Tanya Lerman, who I believe is at Stanford now, who wrote a book several years ago called When God Talks Back. And it was really, it was about... Um, a certain evangelical denomination of Christianity that trains people to hear the voice of God. Wow. That, 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 that encourages a kind of prayer that um, moves one to a very personal experience of Christianity, one in which you could actually have almost a vocal conversation, although it's internal, but, but a very close um, conversation with God or with Christ. Um, and in which that experience is, is honored. Uh, you know, lots of charismatic brands of Christianity encourage these, these sort of unusual experiences, speaking in tongues, um, uh, hearing the voice of God, prophecy, all these things, uh, and charismatic brands of religion are, are, are on the rise. So what Tanya Lerman's research, what her, uh, her, um, her research has shown is that you could train yourself to have these experiences, that if they're deemed within your subculture to be honorable and to have meaning, and if there's sort of practice involved, if that kind of prayer is, is part of a regular training, then, then you could have these experiences in that way. The brain can be taught to have that experience. Well, you know what's really fascinating about that is that it seems like these people are learning to control their, or let's say, learning to control access to these voices. And perhaps the danger of it becoming pathological would be humans getting confused as to whether you know, having these voices barge in on their regular conversations or something like that. So I wonder if the the religious practicers aren't sort of developing a technology for accessing this power. I think that's a really, I think there are two ways to think about it. And one is the way that you just put it really nicely, which is that they're developing the technology, you know, the neurological technology, I suppose, if that's not oxymoronic, um, to, to have these experiences um, and to have them in a way that, um, that doesn't immediately shut them down, but in fact fosters them. Uh, I, think, I think 
it's important also to to think in the in in emotional terms about this. Um, the reason I started to write about and to think about hearing voices is that when I was around, I think I was around fourteen, my parents took me out to dinner. Uh, and sat me down and said, listen, we have something to tell you. Your father uh, hears voices and he's heard them all his life. Uh, and we want you to know that if you have this experience, you're not crazy, but that you should, you should tell us about it. Um, and I didn't, and neither did either of my older brothers uh, had this experience. But, um, but my father did, and he started to hear them when he was around 11 or 12, we think. And he told no one. Hmm. He didn't tell my mother, um, whom he married and had three children with. Um, he went through his life hiding this experience from everyone because to his mind, uh, if he told other people, they would assume that he was psychotic. They would assume that he was dangerously psych psychotic. And when he said this to my mother, of ultimately, after having a nervous breakdown in his, well, he must have been close to 40, I think, he very honestly said, yes, I don't know if I would have married you. I would have been scared because the cultural meaning of that experience was psychosis, danger, violence, threat. Um, the, the culture in which one um, is immersed changes the meaning of the experience itself. So at the, at, at one, at the same time, these people that we're talking about, these charismatic Christians, um, not only are, are immersed in a culture that honors these experiences, but that encourages and trains them. Uh, for people like my father, it must have been very confusing. We're Jewish. So he grew up and, you know, learned the Torah where um, everyone from Adam to Moses to many of the prophets heard the voice of God. And yet when he heard it, he knew immediately that it was dangerous and that the thing to do was to repress it, to stop it from happening, which very often neurologically just causes the experience to recapitulate itself. But did he interpret it as the voice of God? No, he didn't. Do you think he, he would have in another time? I think it's, it's, it's hard to know. He wasn't raised very religious. Um, mm. And his voices were of a very particular sort. His voices... Now... A disclaimer is that I don't really know exactly. My father died of cancer when I was 20, and it was only after that that I could write about his experiences because he was so ashamed for the whole, his entire life. He wouldn't talk about them. So I was able to get some information. I was able to get his psychiatric records. I was able to ask questions of my mother, but even my mother knew very little. Mm. What we knew is that his voices were, um, in a way, they were, they were what are known as command hallucinations. Very simply... They told him to do certain things, but the things they told him to do were move this mug from this side of the table to that side of the table, hmm. use this coin in this turnstile, subway turnstile. And he would feel that if he didn't, if he didn't say yes, if he didn't agree to what the hallucination, the voice was telling him to do, he, something bad would happen to him or his family. Now that's very indicative. If it wasn't, if it wasn't vocal, if it wasn't audible, that's just obsessive compulsive disorder. But he was um, hearing it outside of his own head. So I don't know. Huh. He used, he, he called it voices. He called it hearing voices. Once you start p talking to people who hear voices, once you start really interrogating them, it becomes unclear to what extent the experience is actually audible, right? In which you can produce a grid um, um, and say, tell me where in space you hear it. And to what extent the phrase hearing voices is metaphorical for a certain um, alienated consciousness, for an experience that 
feels as if it's separate from your own consciousness. Now, if you're experiencing something that's separate from your own consciousness and it has content, as human beings who are trained to use and employ language, you're going to use the metaphor of language because you're going to feel as if you have been um, told to do something. You've been feel as if you have, you, have, you have been motivated to do something. And the only way to explain that to yourself is to use language. It could be that there is a sort of rather fast mechanism of, of consciousness that makes that even feel audible. There's, there's a lot of things going on here, right? If you're, if you're part of this charismatic Christian community and you have pastors and, and fellow um, uh, uh, members of your church who talk about it in audible terms and talk about it as having a conversation with Christ and having a direct and personal relationship with Christ and exchanging dialogue, then this experience that in another um, mode, in another, in another place and time might be considered, might feel less verbal, less audible, might be felt, actually felt and it's experienced as audible. So the line between uh, literal audibility of these experiences and, and sort of the metaphor of hearing, it's very, very difficult to, um, to, to, to sort of slice that thinly. And to some extent, it seems like most humans think in voices. Am I correct about that? It's, I mean, I don't necessarily know what humans think like, but I know that I think in voices. Somebody's always talking. I do too. I think it's me. I think I hear. In, I think in voices as well. Um, and and it's hard. It's hard to know again what is um, our training in consciousness, and what is the actual way that human consciousness works. Whether um, the myriad things we read and see the metaphors for the mind. Um, you know, there have been plenty of, of popular sitcoms that in order to dramatize human beings thinking, use the voice. Um, theater has done this for centuries. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't, in, in television, you can actually just show persons with their lips not moving and then hear a sort of voiceover hmm. in which they're thinking. Um, we have read, read many novels over the course of, of centuries that also produce consciousness as a kind of voice. How is James Joyce going to dramatize the consciousness of, of Leo Bloom or of Stephen Dedalus in Ulysses? He's going to have to do it through language. That is the main vehicle by which we communicate. So is that actually how the mind is meant to produce thought or is that how we've become trained to understand and experience thought well this, um, I'm not sure there's any yeah, there's any definitive way to answer this kind of connects to the other book that you're writing right now which is on negative emotion because without language all that you really have is emotion and so language is the process by which you actually take something that one feels and turn it into something that can be interrogated and understood and actually acted upon. Because before yes. that, it's just this incohate something. I think that's absolutely true. And, uh, and that probably is a very uh, cogent definition of why psychotherapy exists. I'm at the same time writing this book, I'm training to become a psychotherapist. Hmm. Um, and of, co of course, the, the so-called talking cure is, um, in a nutshell, the use of language to interrogate and change thought and emotion. So um, what might be a kind of... Now, there are continue to be um, many conflicts about what emotion actually is. Hmm. I mean, people have been asking that question, what is an emotion for centuries? And nobody seems to have answered it. Do you have, a, do you have an answer? I don't. I don't. <laughs> I've read, 
I've read all the philosophers. I've read everyone from, you know, Aristotle uh, um, to Antonio Damasio. And, and I have had to stop doing that and simply write about it. Um, but I do, I do think it's always important to keep Darwin in mind. Darwin wrote a book called The Expression of Emotions in Man and Animal, um, which in which he, he showed that all animals seem to experience something like emotion. That's a very unpopular uh, perspective on Earth right now, isn't it? Uh, among dogmatic religious people, it might be. But I'm not sure that anyone really can dispute that anymore. I'm not sure anyone would really dispute that. They may, they may dispute whether animals have souls, but whether your dog feels emotion, um, you know, whether even a paramecium uh, um, responds to external stimuli is, is beyond dispute. You can see it happening. You can see what happens when a bird um, is under threat and has the fight or flight mechanism. Dar Darwin describes really beautifully um, a bird uh, um, fainting hmm. uh, out, of, out of fright. Hmm. Um, the difference is, might be what, what you're, you're talking about, which is the, the ability to, to reflect upon these experiences and to ask what, what does it mean? and thereby to a certain extent, to, to whatever extent's possible, given your circumstances and your temperament, to alter those emotions. Well, that seems uh, what language is necessary for, right? It's the abstract connection of different concepts, where if you experience a fright, and, you know, there's a shape that causes that fright, and you can't necessarily explain what that shape is or where it came from, can you differentiate between random shapes or will any random shape always cause fright? Language is kind of the way I think that it's possible to take something that causes fright and define it and explain it away to say, well, only this subset of things cause fright. There's these studies with chimpanzees that people do, which you human monkeys experimenting on other monkeys is always really strange to me. Quinn loves monkey Eat. studies. I do love monkeys. <laughs> but you see these studies where chimpanzees will be scared of something that looks like a snake, even though it's clearly not a snake to human perspectives. Why can a human tell apart that something is a real snake versus a fake snake, but the chimpanzee can't? Is it language? Is it the ability to actually tell yourself what that is? Is that what keeps humans from being completely overrun by emotion only? Because emotion seems primary. I mean, I think emotion is primary. And one way I tend to think, I seem to think of it these days, and, and somehow um, inspired by narrative um, narrative ways of thinking about psychotherapy is the ability to tell stories about what that shape is. Mm -hmm. um, in certain circumstances, the shape that looks like a snake is a snake. In certain circumstances, it's not. Um, you, you will probably always, when you see, like the monkey in the study, when you see that slithering shape, have an immediate experience but what you can do as a human is immediate is stop yourself and say is it you can ask the question um whether language is necessary for that i'm not entirely sure i tend to think it is because that's how we learn to ask questions and that's how we learn to interrogate but it also i mean one thing i was thinking about while you were talking about the strangeness of of humans is um, is also um, and I tend to fixate on this is is labeling. Um, we call certain emotions negative emotions, but it's unclear to me what what that means. Hmm. A monkey doesn't know whether fear is bad or good, um, whereas humans can tell themselves in certain circumstances fear is is positive 
and in certain circumstances, it's negative. Hmm. And our job is to say in which circumstances it's one or in which circumstances the other. Um, Don't you think that that has there's something... a moral valence? Oh, oh, go ahead, moral valence. There's a moral valence to to our emotional experiences. That just as there's an moral valence, or as there there's become a certain moral valence to hearing voices. And the way that this valence is um, is produced is through language. So that um, the research I did about hearing voices, I was able to track down the way in which um, hearing voices went from this experience that could have meant a number of different things, spiritually, poetically, um, to something that meant psychiatric. And that was very simply by naming and defining the experience as an hallucination mm. and collapsing all of these words, all of these experiences into the word hallucination so that everyone who was talking about those experiences had no choice by whatever consensus had formed to use that word. And once they used that word, they were working within the discourse of psychiatry because psychiatry was the one who had defined hallucination as hearing or seeing something that isn't there, which is itself was a pathological discourse. So if you start using that word, even the people who, who argued in this big dispute in French psychiatry in the 19th century, in the early 19th century, and said, this is very dangerous. If you start saying this, then, then all of our, our, um, the roots of our faith will be deemed pathological. Hmm. Moses, Muhammad, Joan of Arc, St. Teresa, um, all of these great figures, uh, um, St. Peter on the road to Damascus, um, all of these will be deemed uh, um, pathological. And a lot of good has... St. Paul, I'm sorry, St. Paul on the road to Damascus. Didn't want to get that wrong. We don't know our scripture too well yet. <laughs> Couldn't call you on that, Viewer, sorry. Viewers will. <laughs> I'll take your word for it. But it's sort of worked out for a lot of these folks. That's Which what's folks? really interesting. These, halluc these hallucinating historical figures. Well, I think that it worked out because they were in a context where it was okay. Like, you talk about Joan of Arc. I really like the story about Joan of Arc. And something that seems to get lost sometimes is a detail that you include about how all of France was waiting for a female savior. I'm not sure that all of France was waiting for a female savior. A lot of it was just the, the power of Joan's remarkable personality. I but there was some sort of prophecy standing that a uh, maiden would rise and save people from oh, something. Oh, was there? It's been a long time since I've read my own book, guys, so I apologize for that. Um, I, do know, I do know that um, it didn't work out very well for Joan, obviously. She was burned at the stake. Well, um, but in some sense, that's not a bad fate for a peasant who feels sort of no sense of meaning in their lives and gets to lead an army to victory and has this whole public life. And I mean, burning at a stake sounds painful, but it's not it's not a great way to die. Like uh, it's, it's a fast and fiery arc, but otherwise she would have lived the life of a peasant and would have never really been able to be in a position of power or accomplishment or that's absolutely true she was able to lead an arm an army as a teenage girl and the reason she was able to lead an army was by virtue of her voices mm -hmm. by virtue of of the authority of these spiritual voices that she heard and that granted her um uh uh, the 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 power in in the minds of of royals to to lead France to to victory. At the same time, she was able to be interrogated by the Inquisition and found to be demonic 
by virtue of those very same voices. So it really depended on who was doing the interpreting. Mm. Um, as for whether it's better to be burned at the stake after leading an army or to lead a quiet life as a peasant girl in, in France, I'm, I, I'm not faced with that decision. <laughs> The I might out. choose the quiet life and as a peasant, um, but it's hard to know. It wasn't so great there in 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 rural France. There was a lot of uh, you know rapists and bandits uh, going around murdering people. So uh, you know maybe it was better to have this effect, this great impact. Well, there's a third option today, right? Which is to sort of paralyze the voices with some sort of pharmaceutical or. What you don't really have institution, public institutions anymore on Earth, right? Or at least in your country. Yeah, we do. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, they're still there. They're not. They're not as prominent. Prominent, but they're they're certainly there. I I mean the thing that that is important to me is that um, is that people who hear voices have a have a choice, hmm. um, and that meaning is not dictated to people. Hmm. Um, one of my favorite pieces of writing is the first chapter of William James's The Varieties of Religious Experience, hmm. which is called, I think, um, Neurology and, uh, I forget what it's called, something about neurology, in which he basically um, makes his argument for meaning being permitted in unusual experiences. That he argues that there's a real poverty in saying in retroactively diagnosing figures mm -hmm. that, that what's important is not whatever the pathological roots might be of an, ex of an experience, but what the fruits of that may be by, by the logic of saying St. Paul had epilepsy. A lot of people say, St. Paul was epileptic. That's why he had the vision on the road to Damascus by which he converted to Christianity. Um, Socrates, who heard a voice, his personal daemon, um, uh, was either insane or, or had a brain tumor, let's say, or also was epileptic. Any of these, these neurological retroactive expl explanations can go for basically anything, you know? Uh, uh, Picasso was able to paint his paintings and sculpt his sculptures because his brain was wired in a certain way. Uh, uh, Kierkegaard was able to write his works because he had some digestive complaint. Who knows? Everything by this logic is determined physically and neurologically. So it's meaningless. And there's an organization called Hearing Voices Network that formed and has turned into a global movement by which and 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 what it argues for is the same thing that people who hear voices can make of that experience whatever meaning they wish. They do not need to immediately, um, by diktat of the culture, think of these experiences as pathological. Well, and that's that's important to me because if my father had known that, he wouldn't have suffered um, doubly mm. from the experience and from the shame. Yeah, it's really interesting. Very common question on Earth for philosophers is, what is the meaning of life? As if there's a particular answer to that question that can be generalized. Have you read Viktor Frankl? You know, I haven't yet. We love Viktor Frankl, but he really talks, he speaks to what you're mentioning here with discovering your own meaning, even in the worst of situations. So he was a Holocaust survivor yeah, I know. And he latched on to this vision of his wife, whom he didn't realize had already been murdered, and talking to her and talking his way through every day allowed him to have a meaningful existence and finding the simplest ways to do the most mundane chores with the greatest perfection gave him some sense of meaning. And he really makes a great case for this idea that meaning is something that one discovers for oneself as opposed to some top-down greater idea that can be found. 
And it's interesting. Yeah. And it's interesting. This idea that the voice of his wife is basically an external voice that he's talking to, that he forms a relationship with, and it's not quite the same as thinking that you're hearing the voice of God. But I have a hard time figuring out what exactly is different about that. I'm. I don't think there necessarily is a difference. Hmm. Um, I mean, I'm really sympathetic to. Um, existential psychotherapy, which says, which is very much inspired by Frankel and which says very much what you're saying, which is that the, um, the thing that, that drives fundamentally drives human beings is the search for meaning is the desire and the need for meaning. And, uh, and it really homes in on, on that, as, as a means of bringing people out of their suffering. Um, the reason I'm not sure that there's a difference between hearing the voice of God or Viktor Frankl speaking to his wife or me 20 some odd years after my father's death feeling his presence mm. and really still having a relationship with him is that, um, is that they're all metaphorical for the bonds that we try to form and the bonds that we need in order to sustain ourselves. Um, all of them lend credence to the focus that a lot of social psychologists make, which is that, is that a fundamental human need is for other humans mm. and that placed in isolations, humans die, that it is a need, um, just as fundamental as water, oxygen, and food. You know, now, that's, that's so true. We talked to some gerontologists recently, and we read this kind of fascinating book. Who is this guy? Barzilai? Barzilai. Mm -hmm. Dr. Barzilai at Albert Einstein there in New York. And he notes that a good percentage of these, he studies, what are they called? Centenari Super centenarians. Super centenarians. Very old yeah. humans. And... A very common trait is this sense of meaning and purpose, even if it's on a very mundane level, such as taking care of your garden or whatever it be. And the socialization, like you were saying, humans are a social animal and require the companionship of others. And so it seems like creating a relationship to an external god or an external figure in times of great duress, creates a narrative where you aren't alone. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I think that religious believers would be very offended by what we're saying, uh -oh. because they would say, how dare you? It's, it's literal, I'm actually speaking to God. Um, and so to make it into a metaphor is uh, offensive. The, the great writer Flannery O'Connor said, who is a devout Catholic, said of, um, it's a transubstantiation, the idea that, that the wine is actually being made into the blood of Christ and the, the wafer into the body of Christ. Um, if I thought it was just a metaphor, I'd say to hell with it. Hmm. Huh. Um, so so there's, there's that to be said. But one thing I worry about a lot is, in, in this term, these existential terms, in terms of meaning, is human beings losing faith in the future in, in, in the fundamental uh, understanding and belief that things will continue in some way, that because of climate change, um, because of the sense of the things of, of, of humanity coming to an end, that, that it's, it's becoming much harder to take meaning in these small things and planting a garden and having a family. I know that I've gone through periods where the idea of having children seemed to me to be ethically untenable. Mm. And there's a movement in England, uh, Birth Strike, that is um, based on the same idea, that it's unethical given the number of people already on the planet, given resource scarcity, given ecological destruction to have children. And if you don't have children, if you, if you don't accede to that fundamental drive do you lose um, one of the core meaning-making activities of humanity? 
Uh, and I, I worry about that a lot. I know that a lot of increasingly young people um, have, uh, young people increasingly have a lot of anxiety on these counts. Well, I would and, go so far as to say that you're interrupting not just this human drive towards meaning through reproduction, but all of life. Humans are the only creatures on the face of the planet that look around and can even have the moment where they're like, well, maybe we won't reproduce. Literally right. every, and, 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 you're connected by a string to the first life on Earth ever. You're literally like a, a, a dead end in some ways if you don't reproduce. I mean, that depends on if evolution is continuing or not, which, as I understand it, is, is, a, is a big debate uh, among biologists, whether not human in evolution is continuing. Not in an evolutionary standpoint, though I do think that evolution is continuing. I mean more in a meaning standpoint. I think you just mean one organism comes from another organism. Right? Yeah, one organism comes from another organism, comes from another organism, and it's happened for 3.8 billion years of generations mm -hmm. before you've come onto this planet. According to your scientists. According to your scientists. According to our scientists. I don't see how that means that, that the extinction of humans you know, reduces me. It, it reduces me. It, it, it blanks out meaning because we're the only ones who make meaning. We're the only ones who reflect on meaning, far as we know. It's, I imagine that it would block out meaning along the road that you've laid out, which is that raising children is this thing that produces some kind of meaning. And Which, yeah. when you but have But that's moral... just a trend, right? So some folks can find meaning without reproducing, of course. By the way, did you ever get around to reproducing? Daniel? I have three children. <laughs> okay, all right. So I have a, I have a 12-year-old and then decided that I was done and then uh, got divorced and met the love of my life and she very much wanted the children um, and and I by that time I'd sort of gone through a lot of this crisis uh, this sort of ethical crisis um, and and decided that that there was no way to live in the the, pre, the way I'd been living previously without existing in a state of despair. Hmm. Hmm. Um, and also really, really, really wanted a life with this woman. <laughs> so we, we had one and then um, talked a lot about whether um, it was kind to leave that child to have to be alone. And now we have a newborn in the house. Wow. Whoa. Congratulations. We should speak Thank quietly. You. No, it's okay. I'm out in a shed in the backyard where oh. I do my work. Well, so this is a fascinating thing, right? Because there is a moral valence to this choice, this ethical thing of protecting the planet and preventing, moral, uh, preventing ecological collapse. And yet there is such a significant meaning-making process in it. You're molding a creature in a way that those who don't have kids never will be able to do. Yes, so this was the argument that my mother for years said, said or, and other people who basically said, we need more people like you, more thoughtful, moral uh, people like you. And I thought, that's crazy. It's a numbers game. Bill, uh, the, the journalist and author and activist Bill McKibben has a book about this called, what's it called? I think it's called Maybe One, um, in which he essentially argues that it's okay to have children, but you should only have one. Hmm. Um, and uh, I get that because I do think that the problem is demographic. The problem is numbers. Um, the the population growth has been exponential and it's disturbing to look at the, the curve on the charts um, and, and what it was just a hundred years ago and what it is now and that we're inching towards 10, 11 billion people. Um, and there is, there are arguments, the cornucopians, so-called cornucopians think that the more people, the more opportunities there are for brilliant ideas to deal with these problems. Hmm. 
And I tend to think that's crazy. Hmm. Um, I'm sure that there's no real ethical way to square my concerns, my ecological concerns with my behavior in using my own sperm to create as many humans as I have. <laughs> I'm sure that there's no way to square that circle. And that if I was, um, if I had the courage of my convictions, I would have had no children or only one or one with each woman because everyone could reproduce every couple, maybe reproduce once. But, but did uh, that path, but here I am. Did that path contribute to your sense of despair previously? Which path? The path of not having children. It seemed like you were investigating that. It certainly road. pissed my ex-wife off uh, <laughs> to no end. Uh, but um, yes, I think I think there was no way. Basically, you're you're always living in a state of conscious awareness of just how screwed everything is, of just how. Um, of the fact that the West coast of the United States will probably become uninhabitable, uh, in a certain amount of time that, uh, that, uh, desertification of Africa will continue, uh, that Bangladesh will, uh, um, that most of the population centers in the Asian subcontinent will be, um, uh, uh, underwater that, that we're already in a state where there are climate refugees. You're basically just living in, in a state of, of despair because you can't it's recycling and changing your light bulbs. Isn't going to do it. So and the people can, who can control these things aren't doing the things that they can. I wrote a, I wrote an article about a, an organization called the dark mountain project hmm. and an author named Paul Kings North uh, and Paul Kings North was an activist uh, an environmental activist who eventually just said, game over. We need to learn to, to grieve. We need to learn to move through the despair and find a new way to live, a new narrative for humans. And this fascinated me. Um, and, uh, and so that helped me somehow to, to think about whether there's a way through, a way to live with this despair and still find meaning. And the meaning I'm finding is in my marriage and in my friendships and in my, my family in, in re um, reestablishing some connection, not with religious faith, but with cer certain rituals with the Sabbath, neither of us really believe in God. My wife or I, she was raised a lot more faithful than I am and neither of us believe in God, but, but we, we, we keep the Sabbath and we say some of the prayers even knowing it's somewhat hypocritical because it establishes a space of reflection and meaning and gratitude. Mm -hmm. I think gratitude is the thing that, um, that is ultimately salvific. Well, so this is, this actually connects to something that we think about a lot, which is this idea of the pressure of modern life for humans right now. And the way that various mental illnesses can manifest as a reaction to that, where yeah. one person like it seems like there's mental illness is on the rise at least for some population, young men, I believe. Yeah, I think that this ritualistic thing that you're talking about is maybe possible for someone who's in a relationship where there are friends and family. But there are big populations of single young men absolutely that are basically alone, and they don't yeah, have the these loneliness people. epidemic yeah it's very important to think about, particularly with the elderly but um i mean i I'm so glad we're so we're very far away from voices now, by the way uh, this tends to happen. we just start talking and we're going <laughs> the, all these directions. the the um this is what you've you've hit on a topic that interests me almost more than any other right okay. now. And that is one of the reasons that um, I wanted to study to become a psychotherapist, um, aside from the sheer impossibility of, of supporting my family on, on an adjunct or, or freelance journalist salary. <laughs> I can't um, even imagine. You can't even imagine. Uh, but, you know, the, the epi I, I tend to, I'm very skept skeptical of mental health epidemiology. Okay. Because it's it's so hard to know um, how to get those numbers right. Mm. 
for science in general, but yes. General, but, but for, for, for social science, um, particularly, and for the human side, for psychology and, and mental health and, and clinical psychology, it's notoriously hard. Um, and numbers are no, just so, so persuasive by themselves. It's like, and numbers are so persuasive and there's nothing people love more than a number in the first paragraph in the New York times Tuesday sign section <laughs> it drives, it drives me bananas. But, um, but the, uh, you know, so for example, like our auti- is autism on the rise? Well, it, or is it just a matter of an expansive expanded diagnostic cr- uh, criteria? But, but, the epidemiology of, of, of anxiety um, and, uh, and of panic, of depression, uh, of despair, these things coupled with just plain old anecdotal experience and with really deep qualitative work, be that narrative journalism, or qualitative, stu- you know, studies in in peer-reviewed journals that use qualitative methods, show that we're in a really difficult time, um, in which economic uncertainty, in which uncertainty about the climate, in which political upheaval, and which technological change, the rapidity of of technology, the acceleration of technological change, have created something that. Um, that uh, a social an English Polish sociologist whose name is escaping me right now calls liquid modernity, in mm. which there's no real solidity to um, to human experience. And I love this idea. I mean, I love, but I I I'm made very upset by this idea of liquid humanity. Um, it it makes one you know a prog- a, a, a progressive liberal in politics like me become increasingly sympathetic to conservative viewpoints mm. that, that want to maintain some stability in the family structure simply as a bulwark against um, just what the acceleration of, of choice, of media, of change does to the human mind. It's like a protection um, against w- misan- misanthropy or something. Yeah, I mean, I'm writing, I've been struggling over a chapter on annoyance right now, mm. which is a, not a very well studied emotion, because some people say it's just a kind of diluted or um, downstream uh, version of, of, hate, of anger. Um, but when I write about annoyance, I think a lot about life in New York, which drives me nuts on a daily basis. <laughs> um, because I don't think that there's any way to square the way the human mind evolved over the courses, course of millennia, um, you know, on the African plains to the, the stimuli and, and, um, and population density of New York. And the way things that are panning out in human history is that human history is going to look like mega cities, you know, everything's going to look, or most of the humanity is going to be clustered in centers that look more like Mexico city, uh, than like Montana. Um, and what that does to the human mind is I think really, it, I think it, I think the stress that it, that it, that it, that it, um, puts on, on human beings is intolerable. I tend to be someone who's already intolerant of these things and my wife makes fun of me for them. Uh, you know, someone honks outside and it's, it's ruined my day, which is why I, <laughs> I this, which is why I'm talking to you out of a tool shed that I, that I, you know, bought from Home Depot and insulated and put in our backyard. Um, but I, I worry about human beings. I worry about their ability to, uh, to live in these circumstances, especially as the ethical choice is to live in cities. Like ecologically speaking, the ethical cho- cities are much greener than having a big footprint elsewhere. It's much more energy efficient to live in an apartment building, especially a high rise apartment building where heat can be recirculated um, than it is to live somewhere else. It seems yet, like that's- I think it's really horrible. That's true, given the current state of architecture and 
power distribution, things like that. Yeah. Perhaps, well, what I wanted to ask is, do you think that this pandemic thing you guys are experiencing has shifted the persuasion of cities? Has it made them less appealing in some sense? I mean, you know, my wife's cousin, who's a real estate uh, broker in, in Brooklyn, certainly says that it has. And all of the news story I'm, I'm reading say that, uh, you know, people are flooding out of the cities. This has happened before. Mm. Uh, New York, New York and cities will always be attractive. I think it's particularly unattractive now because population density is frightening in terms of virus, virus transmission. And also because there's only, there only a, the reason to live in New York is so you can go to the museums and see theater and be in and date mm. right. and meet people, the excitement of the city. And all that is, is, is impossible right now. Or if, if it's happening, it's happening in a dangerous way. Just growing grocery shopping is really stressful right now. I bet. So I think it'll, it'll probably readjust. Um, but it's certainly not doing what one would hope it would do, which is to um, reacquaint humans with a kind of um, socialistic core. Uh, we're all in this togetherness in, in, at least in, 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 in our, in my country, in, in the United States, it seems only to be increasing polarization in a, in a fairly insane way. But it seems like uh, that's at least in part because people are unwilling to consider the issues of the other side. Where we've talked a lot to, you know, philosophers and psychologists, and it seems like there is this refusal to consider the other side to the degree that humans aren't necessarily even interested in having a conversation with one another, if they disagree on some key aspect. And so polarization is driven by the fact that no one's actually willing to talk to each other. They don't trust each other. And... Yeah. Go, go ahead. No, no, no. There's, I mean, I'm not a political scientist. There's, there's great work being done right now. And... Ezra Klein, who's a great journalist, just wrote a book called Why We're Polarized. There's another political scientist whose name escapes me, also wrote a book about this recently. Um, and it's obviously a really complex phenomenon that has to do with the actual structure of the American political system, which with certain trends, political and demographic trends, um, over the course of decades, but I think that the upshot is that you're right, that no one is able to view the other as acting in good faith. And everyone sees the other side as, um, as, as holding views that are not just antithetical to their own, but, but an egg, posing an existential threat to everything that they value. Um, and, and obviously we need to find a way out of that. And obviously we're not living through one at the moment. Do you think there's shared values that can be discovered between those opposing groups? Yeah, like is there some kind of shared value that can serve as a foundation? That's a good question. I'm not hopeful. Uh -oh. um, I mean, I tend to be a pessimist. Um, you know, the, 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 the thing that, that really brought the United States together um, and allowed us to have, say, um, Social Security was World War II. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, the thing that really brought us together and and transformed the economy was a major war. Um, I was listening to to someone speak, a guy named David French recently, who is a conservative journalist um, mm -hmm. and lawyer and Iraq War veteran who was arguing that, that one thing that could bring people together is a refocus on um, our shared commitment to the Bill of Rights of mm. the United States Constitution, hmm. that, that, uh, that, the cons that conservatives should stop just focusing on 
you know, freedom of speech, freedom of religion and gun rights and start thinking more expansively in terms of um, the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, uh, um, uh, you know, freedom from unwarranted search and seizure, from if, if, we, if we redevote ourselves to this aspect of the founding document, we might be able to find common ground again. But um, it's hard. It's it's hard for me to believe that something as high-minded as that, given the media ecology right now, where things are so polarized, and and there's a financial incentive for things to be as polarized as they are, and with 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 the current sociopath who's in the White House, um, that this would ever happen. Does. The president know there's a sociopath in the White House? Should someone tell him? I don't know if a soci- if you know if you know you're a sociopath, it probably means you're not a sociopath. Oh, he's the sociopath. So I think he knows. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! There are other ones in that building, I'm sure. So, Is the rest of the government concerned? They don't seem. To I be. hope so. My my question is the way that you said that something that you'd been thinking a lot about is this loneliness epidemic, and. Oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say it's it's not so much the loneliness ec- epidemic that it that it is the ways in which um, human life as it's lived in America in the year twenty twenty um, exposure, pol- the political circumstances, the environmental circumstances, the technological circumstances are affecting. Um, the human mind and increasing uh, certain symptoms and and pernicious experiences like anxiety. Lonely, the loneliness ec- epidemic is just one aspect of that. Um, and I think one consequence of the way we live now, and I'm by no means an expert on that. So one thing we've done on our planet that's been really cool is we turn to biomimetic design in tooling our cities. So we had this same problem originally and we went through this crazy cataclysm where we had to move our planet to another solar system and it was a whole mess. We basically had to rebuild our cities from the ground up and when we did it the second time, well we had to rebuild everything, even the forests and we decided to make the cities look like forests basically. So we have these different technologies that look to nature and sort of build in these structures so that the experience of living in cities is more harmonious in the same way. I think a lot of scientists on earth are realizing that nature bathing is healthy. Do you think there's a possibility of that occurring on earth? No. Uh Oh, (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I think it's, I think it's lovely, but, but your experience was that it took a cataclysm. True. Um, you know, one of the, I mean, I, I, I mean, I could never run for public office because I'm such a pessimist. <laughs> um, there's, uh, uh, your slogan could be, we will not hope. We will not hope. Yeah. 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 No, 2024. we can't. Uh, yeah, <laughs> vote Daniel Smith. No, we can't. 2024. Uh, there's the thing that causes such despair and that this organization, Dark Mountain Project has written a lot about is the fact that the the problem is the system in which we live and that there's no way to to fix the system from within the system and there's no way to stop the system really that that our 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 modes of of communication of production of 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 energy of of everything are are so inextricably woven so tightly woven that there's 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 no way to escape them, and that the only way is perhaps a cataclysm, uh, and there might be no way out of that. There's just a, too much momentum. Folk, just too much momentum. There's a poem. There's a, there was a poet that was very popular in the early first half of the 20th century named Robinson Jeffers, uh, who lived out in um, Northern California on um, on the coast, and. Uh, he has a, a poem called the Persane, and he watched these fishermen using a Persane net that kind of very slowly collected the fish into this net, and they didn't realize that they were being pressed into this net until it was too late. Um, 
And this was his very bleak metaphor for, mm. for humanity. And uh, this guy, Paul Kingsnorth and others have written very well about essentially the, the inability to remove ourselves from the, from, from the capitalism from which we're daily benefiting. Mm -hmm. There is no way, there is no way to remove yourself. If you want to wear clothing, if you want to eat food, um, you could, you could make certain adjustments, but they're really on the margin. Yeah. I was going to ask, I hope I'm wrong, but I'm not sure. Do you think it's possible to sort of, I don't want to say socially design, but can you, is it possible to make architecture for your society that has different incentive structures and is able to rewrite these paradigms? So I look at it from the perspective where you have these old institutions, right? And the old institutions don't seem like they're serving you. They're decaying. They're, but they're decaying. And clearly, at some point, new institutions will have to arise. So why is it not possible to seed new institutions with different incentive structures that will actually serve to solve this problem once they become mature? Obviously, it's not going to start as a seedling, but well, eventually. who's creating who's creating these incentive structures? You. I mean, the problem. Me. Well, you know, I'm not. the <laughs> The problem is if the problem is global, and then then you need a global global solution. There, the way that the American political system is built right now, and the way that the political culture in the United States is right now, there seems to be no will to do any of this and no way to really create those incentive structures economically. Hmm. Um, and even if we were, people in India and people in China want to live with the same air conditioning that we've been able to live with for decades. They want to be able to live in the, in, in, in the middle class and deserve to be able to. Um, these developing like, economies aren't going to sit back and say, no, 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 we'll hold off. Now, you would need some sort of broad agreement, which, you know, we were, we were making steps toward, um, but it just, for whatever reason, human nature, the way humans act, behave in groups, the way crowds group work, the way political systems work, I'm not smart enough to say exactly why, that didn't happen. And and the way and and it's 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 too late for to mitigate the the truly extreme effects of what's coming down the pike. So it seems like a cataclysm is coming then, even by your own estimation. Yeah. So then, shouldn't the groundwork be laid now to restructure things in the aftermath of the cataclysm? And yes, please. I mean, you know, I'll, I'm voting for the right people. I'm trying to vote for the right people. Um, yeah, I get but, that. Uh, I'm not a politician. I just write sentences. It, what can and be done? Cop out. What can be done for someone on the street who's not a politician? Like, what if that guy who was writing his poem about the fishermen in the net? What if he decided that, you know, maybe we could close this loop by regulating the size of the nets that the fishermen use. Is there any chain of action that an ordinary person can take to implement changes? I mean, this is, you know, this is what young people are really struggling with right now is, um, I mean, in, in it, the way I hear what you're saying is, 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 is almost an ethical, um, um, not, not command, but, but, uh, focus where everyone has to serve as some instrument to rebuild in a certain way. But I want to live in a world where I think we need poets, <laughs> you know, I think we also need poets who just write poetry. That's about sunsets or going to the bathroom or having a dog or, you know, drinking a cup of coffee. I think that, that I want to live in a world where not everything has to be instrumental. Sure, for the same reason uh, that nature bathing is healthy. What's nature bathing? It's like going out in the woods and... Going barefoot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
So there's a number yeah. of interesting studies about that, correlating it with health and eyesight. Yeah, I've written about some of that as well. Okay. Yeah, about the idea of whether there's something called an ecological unconscious, a sort of an inherent need for, um, for those types of experiences and places. And I don't want to make nature into a, just a plain old therapeutic, right? Hmm. Because that's, that, is, that is keeping the same, that is maintaining the same kind of consciousness, human consciousness vis-a-vis -vis nature. That's, that alienates humans from nature in the same way. It says, hmm. we're using nature to make ourselves calmer. Whereas that, that's the kind of thinking that got us into this problem in the first place. So I'm just guessing you thinking, don't want poetry to look like that either. You don't want poetry to be seen as a refuge or something. Like you'd rather see po I, poetry included in more aspects of daily life or? I mean, I, I, I don't, I mean, I don't like to instrumentalize really any things that aren't instruments, <laughs> you know, like, like if, you know, if poetry makes you feel better, fine. But to, but to call, you know, a lot of people do view poetry in therapeutic terms, mm -hmm. you know, the way, the way they do scented candles and, hmm. um, you know, long baths and, well, it's been know, kind of, just, that's facile. It's gotten kind of boxed in. What's really interesting. We talk about this a lot is that actually on earth, a lot of your philosophers and scientists, not only were the same people originally, but they were also poets. Who was it? The, the first theory of the atom on earth was delivered in a big, long poem written in meter. Yeah. Democritus, yeah, I believe. Democritus. That's the one. Yeah. I mean, you know, Newton was also an alchemist. Newton, <laughs> Newton believed very fiercely. Um, yeah, it's 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 true that uh, that specialization and the putting up of firewalls between um, different modes of thought has had both very positive results and also very negative results, um, and uh, and it's hard to tease those out as well. It's just been a very disintegrative progress in a way that technically disintegrative progress. I like that phrase. Thanks. That, that, appeals, that appeals to the pessimist in me. What do you mean? Uh, well, I'm just thinking it's interesting. Um, we're scientists, obviously, so we think about... And, and we're also really into earth art, and we love earth music and poetry. It's just interesting how it's become separate. These things have sort of fallen out. A scientific article is almost impenetrable for the average earthling at this point, whereas it was sort of originally viewed as something that should be accessible so much so that the scientists in antiquity, if you could call them that, were making poems to promote beauty and accessibility. Yeah, but I'm not, you know, it's, it's maybe easier to comprehend Newtonian motion than it is to comprehend string theory or quantum mechanics. Um, uh, or, you know, um, uh, Einstein's theory of special relativity, like these things are also harder to understand. I'm not sure how you'd make a poem that, that in, in, improves access to Einstein's theory of relativity. Um, I've tried to understand it many times on my own as I'm, I think I'm a pretty intelligent guy and I still don't really understand it. But that might just um, be because humans don't really understand it yet either. Or because it's presented in mathematics, right? Yeah. And mathematics like we don't are inherently a language that most humans don't have an intuitive sense of. You know, so I, was, I was watching this video about the incredible way in which the human brain is able to track movement. You know, they strap a camera on somebody's head and this person's walking down a path and it can track where the person's eyes are looking as the person yep. is making decisions for how to walk. And it's an incredibly complex mathematical formula that the brain just does on its own. And you understand how the brain does it because you recognize that there's some integration of the signal where you're walking down the path and you know you want to avoid the rocks and whatever. It's just this very 
complex process that happens intuitively. But you write it down in mathematical equations and you put it in front of somebody and they're never going to understand it. That's true. But I, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not inclined to blame the scientists on this one, you know, like, like as, as knowledge increases, I think specializ specialization becomes necessary, um, you know, to, to talk about the body in terms of four humors is, is, isn't too hard to understand, but to write about the brain and to understand the brain, you're going to need to a whole bunch of different people studying different aspects of it, studying the amygdala and what it does, studying the corpus callosum, studying, you know, interferon, all these different things. Um, and, and hopefully there'll be some synthesis at some point. Um, but I, I don't know. I think, I think knowledge is increased to such a, at such a rate that, that it's, an, it inherently has to be specialized. It's a bummer. What was the old, you know, what was the old saying that, that um, I've forgotten whose day in whose, whose time it was in the medieval period that, um, you know, any, if you did your reading, you could, you could, you could possess in your mind all of human knowledge, mm. in, you know, in one library that, that wasn't that long ago in historical time. Now it's utterly impossible. Well, there's also this question um, and, of specialization and the lack of attention paid to generalists. Like you mentioned Darwin earlier, and I've read some of The Origin of Species, and mm -hmm. Darwin is basically a jack-of-all-trades. He raises birds, he looks at insects, he counts plants, he just kind of does all sorts of stuff. He's not a specialist by any stretch of the imagination, but he is a generalist extraordinaire and has had this incredible perspective across many different fields and many different experiences, and he spends his time corresponding with people that are studying other things and asking them questions. And it's this generalist perspective, this overview perspective, that gives him the opportunity to connect ideas, to kind of create something that wasn't there before. But it seems like that's missing yeah. from human science practice today, where everyone is a general, sorry, everyone is a specialist. I'm not sure. I mean, I... How many people are wandering so around just looking at all of these different fields and attempting to create a cohesive A lot of narrative? philosophers now. I mean, someone mm. like Martha Nussbaum, someone like the philosopher Martha Nussbaum is deeply conversant in literature, in poetry, in music, in, in neuroscience, in, in classical philosophy, in, um, in psychology. She's, she, she does crossover. You know, a social scientist like Cass Sunstein uh, is Daniel Kahneman, yeah, specialized in, in certain things, but he seems to have a pretty capacious understanding. I think there are a lot of philosophers who have made a really good faith effort. Um, who are the, who's that couple that uh, studies consciousness? Um, I've, I've, I, I've I, not too long ago read a great profile of them. The, the Churchlands, Patricia mm -hmm. and uh, her husband, uh, forget his name, Churchland. These are people who, who are in the, are in the so-called humanities or uh, philosophy, wherever that's pigeonholed now, but who are very conversant, um, um, fluent even in, in, in neuroscience, in anthropology, in um, all different modes of thought. And, and there are a lot of people like that actually. Hmm. Um, and there are more, opportunity there's a more there, there's more of a democratization of information than there was in say john locke's or newton's day or in darwin's day um and i celebrate that you know you could you you could get access to information in a way that you simply couldn't back then unless you had a lot of money and that's a beautiful thing that's a beautiful thing you know you there's there's open access libraries there's gutenberg.org where everything Every book that's in that's in uh, um, the public domain, you could just go on and download for free and read. Uh, so I'm not. That's where I'm. I'm far more optimistic hmm. than 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 even you. I think um, where I think there are a lot of generalists, even as academia 
incentivizes the opposite. I guess what's really it's academia that screwed, not human thought. <laughs> yeah, I guess what's interesting is that those authors that you just listed are, in some senses, outsiders to the specialist disciplines. Like, while they might be fluent in some discipline, they're not of that discipline. Is that safe to say? Uh, sure, but but I'm not sure that Darwin was of some of these disciplines. Um, no, 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 no. You know, Darwin, Darwin was a naturalist. There was always names for, for people like him. And, you know, Darwin, Darwin wasn't conversant with everything. You know, Benjamin Franklin in the 18th century can be conversant with a whole different ways of thinking. But again, there were fewer, <laughs> there were fewer, there were fewer areas. There were fewer sources of knowledge. There were fewer people making those experiments than there are than there is now. Um, right. There's a lot more knowledge being generated. I, mean, I would love to continue this conversation. This was a lot of fun. I'm sorry I have to go. No, thank you for your time. Thank it's you so much. It's been really informative. Absolutely. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. It's good talking to other generalists. <laughs> exactly. Space generalists. <laughs> Space generalists. I'm glad that we could end on an optimistic note. Me too. Me too. A lot of great people out there. Okay. Well, good. gratitude. That's where we have to we have to land on gratitude for whatever we can be grateful for. I love that. Well, good luck you. with your humans on Earth. And we look forward to your book. Oh. We'll be out Thanks here so to much. Us. Can you? Would I you, sure. I sure will. Do you have a title for it? I don't yet. Okay. I don't yet. Still working on it. Um, but uh, it's taken a long time, and it's it's going to take a little while, long, while longer. And where can people find you? Uh, I am on. Twitter under, um, what is my Twitter name? Morbid Origin, ah. <laughs> which is actually from that, uh, that, that chapter of William James, hmm. nice. where he tries to do away with what he calls the bugaboo of Morbid Origin. So at Morbid Origin, okay. uh, I don't believe I have a workable website right now. So that's, uh, that's where I am. All right. Well, cool. Let people know. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks guys. Bye. That was a lot of fun. Bye. Bye.